Hey, welcome back. In this video, I just want to go over the idea of three force members and what that means to us when we're analyzing uh, frame and machine problems. So just before we get into the three force members, I'll do a quick review on two force members. Um, if you remember, if we have some object uh, that has two forces acting on it, if we know where one force acts and the direction that the force is going in, then for this object to be in static equilibrium, the other force just has to be somewhere along this line of action uh, and going in the equal and opposite direction. So if this was, let's say, 10 kilonewtons, uh, then this guy down here would have to be 10 kilonewtons, equal and opposite, and sharing the same line of action. So we could actually put this 10 kilonewton force anywhere. We could have, we could have drawn it right here, um, and that would also have made this object in static equilibrium. If we drew it uh, in the same direction, but not in the not in that line of action, um, then this object wouldn't translate, but it would have the tendency to uh, to want to rotate, I guess, uh, this way, because we would now be introducing a force couple, and this object wouldn't be in static equilibrium. All right, um, and then just also obviously, if instead of having these blue forces, if the two forces for some reason we thought if if they went like this. Um, then this object wouldn't be in static equilibrium because it would have the tendency to translate that way. And if it has the tendency to translate, then the forces aren't canceling each other out, and then it's not in static equilibrium. All right, so what this means for a frame, instead of a potato-looking shape, uh, we could have a frame that looks like this, where we have this straight yellow member, this straight yellow member, and, uh, and this kind of odd-shaped orange member here, and a whole bunch of forces acting on the two yellow members. But you'll notice on the orange member, and everything's pin connected, you'll notice the orange member, the only two forces that actually act on this member uh, or come from the pin here, from this yellow member, and then from the pin here. So for this, uh, for this whole system, if it's in static equilibrium, each part of the system has to be in static equilibrium. And so that means that if this orange member only has two forces acting on it, then we can go ahead and connect those two and then I'm not sure if this would be pushing or pulling but the forces the unknown forces that are acting at this pin would uh, let's say maybe be pulling that way and it, it would be equal and opposite in that way um, and then we, we could use this information to solve the whole problem uh, and this would simplify our process because this would be the same magnitude as this and we'd know these angles because it's uh, defined by the geometry of the problem here uh, basically this this lines angle off the horizontal so anyways that's two force members um, now if we have objects uh, or if we have members in frames that have three forces acting on them then there's also there's two situations that they can potentially be uh, in static equilibrium so let's draw some more potatoes here um, if we have this object here uh, if we have three forces acting on it let's say we have one like this one like this and one like that. Well, obviously this object wouldn't be in static equilibrium because it has the tendency to translate up and the tendency to translate over and nothing resisting those. So it's going to want to translate kind of up in that direction. So this would not be a candidate for static equilibrium. But if we have, let's say, um, these, these two forces going off to the right, and if we have another one that's parallel going the other way, well, it's possible that this object could be in static equilibrium. If this, for example, was 10 kilonewtons, this guy was 10 kilonewtons, and this one was maybe 20 kilonewtons, uh, and it was exactly halfway in between these two dist uh, these two forces, then this object would be in static equilibrium. So one of the one of the uh, scenarios where a member or an object. Uh, can be in static equilibrium when three forces are acting on it is if those if those forces are coplanar and parallel. And I say coplanar because well in this in 2D problems the plane of the page is uh, is the plane that we're dealing with and so these would all be in the plane of the page. But for a 3D object, if you imagine that these two were still going this way and this third force was actually coming out of the page at you, uh, well then this object wouldn't be in static equilibrium because it would have the ten tendency to translate off to the right and also straight towards you. So for 2D problems, they'll always be coplanar, but just watch out for that in 3D problems. Uh, now this isn't to say that just because an object has three parallel forces that it has to be in static equilibrium. You could imagine if we had 
two forces like that, and then the third one like this, they're all parallel. Um, maybe these are 10, 10, and 20 again. Uh, it's not going to translate right or left because the, the sum of forces in the x direction is cancelled, but the, this, uh, this creates a, basically a force couple and this object would have the tendency to rotate uh, in that sense. So for an object with three forces acting on it that's in static equilibrium, uh, it's, it's possible that the forces uh, are parallel, but it doesn't mean that because forces are parallel, this object is in static equilibrium. Um, the other way that we can get uh, an object with three forces acting on it and that object to be in static equilibrium is if those forces are concurrent. So if we draw another object here, um, let's say we had a force going straight up and then we had a force going off in this direction and if their lines of action are concurrent, and then we had the other force like this, um, let's say that all three of these angles were 120 degrees and all of the magnitudes of the forces were all the same, so maybe 10 kilonewtons. Um, obviously in this situation, this object would be in static equilibrium. All these forces are cancelling each other out. It's not going to translate in any one of these directions. And because all of these uh, lines of action are passing through the exact same point, there's no force couples being created and uh, this object wouldn't rotate. So this is the other type of problem that you can get where you have three forces acting on an object and, and it's in static equilibrium. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, when we have concurrent forces that they always have to have the same magnitude for it to be in static equilibrium, but in this case, if they all have the same angle and we increased one of these maybe to uh, 30, then in this situation, <clears throat> this object would have the tendency to translate this way and it wouldn't be in static equilibrium. But if we, uh, if we have a slightly different setup, we can have uh, some object and let's say we have a force here of 30 kilonewtons and then we have a force maybe up here of 40 kilonewtons well if we had another force here there is a combination that we can make it so this is static equal statically uh, in static equilibrium so if we uh, draw on the lines of actions of these forces we know that we basically just have to have a force that's going down and over and whose line of action uh, passes through this point, uh, that point. Um, so we could draw on our force here. Now this force has to have the components of uh, to cancel out, basically to cancel out these translations. And if we, uh, if we did a simple little force triangle here, 30 and 40, the resultant of those two forces would be 50 kilonewtons. Uh, so basically we just need to have a force that's going down and to the left in this direction uh, that's 50 kilonewtons. Right, I hope that makes sense. The y component would be 40, the x component would be 30 to the left, and uh, and that cancels this out. And there's no, uh, there's no force couples created by these three forces because they all have this, this point that their lines of action pass through. If we drew a, a force that was uh, on that angle, and I think that angle is actually, uh, it's about 36.9 degrees, and so that's, that's this angle, 36.9 degrees, and also 36.9 degrees, that's that angle. If we drew a force, if we tried to draw a third force instead of this blue one, if we drew it here, with the right magnitude and direction, but its line of action was not concurrent with the other two, then basically we would have the resultant from from this guy and this guy more or less acting like that, so 50 kilonewtons going off that way. Well, we wouldn't get any translation in this object, but we would definitely get uh, we would definitely get uh, the tendency to translate or to rotate because we would be actually now creating a force couple. So as long as uh, so the forces so as long as the, all of the lines of actions of the forces pass through a single point and then they they sum to zero in the x and y directions, then we know we have a an object with uh, with three forces acting on it that has uh, that is in static equilibrium. So no translation, no moments. And what that means to us when we're looking at something like this, um, if we added an, one extra force, actually, you know what, maybe we should, uh, we'll copy and paste this. 
So if we added one extra force uh, that's acting on this orange member, then this orange member actually becomes a three force member because it has one force from this pin, one force from this pin, and now this would be the third force. And let's say somehow in solving this problem, um, we were able to determine that the force that this pin exerts on the orange uh, member is in that direction. Then we would just draw the line of action of that force, and then we would know the line of action of this force because it would be given to us. And then now we would be able to determine just gra uh, graph or visually the the line of action of this last force, and it would have to basically pass through uh, pass through this point. And actually, and then you'd be able to determine you might be able to determine the direction that it's actually going, or, or it could be going that way. Uh, in this case, it would actually have to go to the right to cancel out some of those leftward x components of this. But anyways, that would uh, that would again it simplifies the the uh, the process of solving these problems because now it's one less unknown thing. We know the exact direction of this force, and then all that we'd be left to determine would be uh, would be the magnitude. So. Uh, if you're able to identify two force members or three force members in these sort of uh, complicated frame problems, it just simplifies your analysis a lot by, by removing some of the, the doubt on what, what direction these forces are actually pointing.